theistic evolution critique without a mechanism. We've been discussing the book, Theistic Evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. Um, it's a doorstop of a book. Huge thing. Surprisingly, has turned into one of the bestsellers um, of the Discovery Institute, probably because it is so rich. And uh, before we go too far, I'm going to note, as I've noted before, that in fact, uh, <clears throat> we can look at the, the views that people can hold of uh, how we got here in s several different ways. You can have young life creationism. Um, you can have old earth creationism. It's technically old earth, old life creationism because young life creationism could include an old earth, but just young life. Um, but it's traditionally called old earth creationism. Uh, you can have uh, theistic evolution that agrees with intelligent design. That is, God worked, he worked slowly, but the work is detectable. Then you can have wh what I would call non intelligent design theistic evolution. That is to say, God created the process, turned it loose, and did not try to control it. And that if you look at the process, it looks for all the world like atheism. And then finally you have, of course, full-blown atheistic evolution with no God whatsoever. Now, traditionally, intelligent design has primarily aimed at atheistic evolution, but this time their emph emphasis is going to be on non-intelligent design theistic evolution. And they're going to critique it from the uh, scientific, but also the philosophical and religious point of view. And when we get to the religious point of view, it is going to be astounding to watch how their critique goes um, this chapter that we're looking at is written by Matti Lysola, who is, as far as I can tell, from Finland. Um, it fits into part one of the book, which is the scientific critique of theistic evolution. And it is part one of that part. Uh, part two will discuss human and chimpanzee uh, relationships um, and uh, the the uh, t the chapter itself is entitled evolution a story without a mechanism at the front there is a summary at best science is a search for truth about nature how it functions and changes at worst it is a, sci a search for only naturalistic explanations for life history is biology best explained by randomness or by a regulating intelligence? Can science prove one of the options to this philosophical question wrong? Several lines of experimental evidence show that novel functional genes and proteins cannot be formed de novo by chance processes. But can novel functional genes, proteins, or novel organisms be produced from existing ones by random methods? Individual genes, proteins, and microorganisms are easy to manipulate. They can produ be produced by in large quantities and exchanged to the extreme in a laboratory, much more than could ever be happening in nature. Thus, the laboratory experiments using random evolutionary methods are intelligently designed to study the limits of what randomness can do in biology, not what can actually happen in real life. Nevertheless, natural selection can only select what random mutations first produce. And for the evolutionary process to produce new forms of life, random mutations must first have produced new genetic information for building novel proteins. Since the late 1960s, however, mathematicians and molecular biologists have argued that producing new functional genes, new genetic information, and proteins via a random mu mutational search is improbable in the extreme. The results of such experiments give a definite, definite answer. There are narrow limits to the changes that random processes can achieve. They can never convert one gene to a basically different gene, one protein structure to a different structure, nor one microorganism to a different one. 
Thus evolution is a story without a mechanism. And adding the ther term theistic to it adds nothing to ex its explanatory power. That's kind of the um, summary. And now we get something that just uh, stunned me when I noticed it. The chapter begins with a virtually verbatim quote of that summary. Um, the parts that are in red are exactly verbatim. The then inserted in here is the question that goes back to Socrates, can science provide an answer to this philosophical question? Um, in chapter two, Stephen Meyer argues based on experimental research that the neo-Darwinian mechanism of mutation and selection does not provide an adequate explanation for the origin of genetic information. In this chapter, you will notice that it, uh, several lines of experimental evidence is quoted before. Um, uh, and then it goes also on. Uh, there's uh, this word can is transposed in the summary. Um, and uh, uh, radically instead of, uh, uh, there's an, uh, two words that are used there and I forget what they are, but they basically mean radically. And uh, instead of happen, it says, uh, be happening in nature in the, in the original, or in the summary. And the word the is inser uh, inserted and themselves is taken out. Now, it's very interesting to ask the question, which came first? Um, and here, these experiments are transmuted into they. Um, other than that, it's identical. You think that happened by chance. I rather suspect what happened was he had a summary at the beginning and then they said oh we need a summary and so he did the summary and nobody thought to say but there's a lot of repetition there. But in any case that was, that was inter interesting to me. Introduction a team from my university has just won a gold medal in a synthetic biology competition. The presentation can be downloaded. Um, they produce propane using genetically engineered Escherichia coli bacteria. Throughout my entire career in universities and the biotech industry, my research teams have aimed at, aimed at improving what nature can do using both random and design methods. Improvement means tricking microbes or enzymes to do more than they naturally do, to produce compounds they naturally do not produce, to tolerate extreme conditions, etc. Ever since the discovery of microorganisms in the 19th century, they've been used to make a variety of products. Once a suitable production organism has been found, scientists try to produce increased production rates by random method, mutations, and since the discovery of genes and genetic engineering tools by systematic design. In this chapter, I want to point out, using some concrete examples, that both approaches have their limitations. Microorganisms and their proteins can change and be changed only within narrow limits. But before going into detail, it is important to define some terms. Uh, definition of terms, Philip Johnson and many others have pointed out that the term evolution has many meanings. We've been through this a little earlier. Uh, Merriam-Webster defines evolution as a theory that the various types of animals and plants have their origin in other pre-existing types and that the distinguishable differences are due to modifications in successive generations, where, in line with the neo-Darwinian synthesis, modifications refers to changes in DNA produced by mutations and recombination. The changes to DNA occur at random and are fixed in successive generations by natural selection and or genetic drift, processes studied by population genetics. Merriam-Webster de defines design as deliberate purposive planning. According to this definition, Miller-Urey type origin of life experiments are examples of design, as are all breeding experiments with plants and animals, no matter what the methods are. I want to emphasize that any experiments done by humans that tries to imitate what happens in nature is not what really happens in nature. 
For example, large-scale application of antibiotics in animal feed has led to an increase in antibiotic-resistant bacteria. This how is, however, not what happens naturally. It is a large-scale design experiment. Well, kind of a side effect of design, but yes. The large-scale applications of antibiotics is a man-made process that forces microorganisms to express antibiotic-resistant genes or by mutation to modify their antibiotic receptors, nothing more. Every attempt to mimic evolution in the laboratory is an example of design, not an example of what actually happens in nature. All such experiments, as clever as they might be, search the limits of natural processes. Anything proceeding under artificial selection is not evolution, but design. Designed randomness experiments. What then happens in nature? Average mutation rates are in the order of 10 to the minus 10. How often a certain base in DNA is mutated per cell division? Negative mutations exceed positive ones by 1,000 to 1 million fold, according to various estimates, estimations. Jerry Bergman reviewed the, the topic of beneficial mutations. He did a simple internet literature search and found 453,732 hits for the word mutation, of which only 186 mentioned the word beneficial. In those 186 references, the presumed beneficial mutations consistently involved loss of function or loss of information changes. In not a single case was new information created. A mutation, even if positive, must also be fixed in a population to be of any benefit. But the majority of mutations do not fix. They are lost. In real life, all of the genomes degenerate, as shown using biologically relevant assumptions in numerical simulations of the mutation selection mechanism. All life has been degenerating since its first appearance. Life's direction is degeneration, not evolution. Um, uh, shades of... Uh, uh, genetic entropy here. Industrial microorganisms, remember this is his special field. Soon after their discovery, Louis uh, Pasteur, Louis I guess it is, uh, showed that uh, microorganisms are not spontaneously formed under sterile conditions in a nutrient solution. In the light of the current understanding of the complexity of even the simplest microorganisms, such a possibility approaches impossibility. In 1887, Pasteur patented a method to produce beer and yeast, and then um, some other people did those kinds of things. During and after the Second World War, large-scale production of antibiotics began. In the 1950s and 1960s, production technologies were adapted to manufacture enzymes, amino acids, vitamins, and vaccines, and recently to produce diagnostic and therapeutic proteins, TPA anyone. How does one improve a biotechnical production process? There are two basic ways, or optimization of the process conditions and optimizations of the production organism. Here I discuss only the latter. To improve the production of compound A, the first step is to go to nature and find, try to find microbial strains that produce more than the previously used one. So you're, you're doing some na uh, unnatural selection, shall we say? Then by random mutation techniques, the strain is made to overproduce the compound, A, in a protected laboratory setting, rendering the strain unab unable to survive in nature. If this is not enough, modern genetic techniques can be used to bring multiple copies of a specific gene into the strain or to design the whole production pathway into an organism. A random methods, using random methods, impressive results have been obtained. Modern production organisms can produce hundreds of times more penicillin than the strain originally isolated by Alexander Fleming in 1929, or over 100 grams per liter of various acids. Um, that's roughly 10% by weight, by the way. Or tens of grams of enzymes secreted from the cell. Why does an organism overproduce, overproduce a certain amino acid, for example? The reason is simple. Its regulatory mechanism has been destroyed by a mutation. Nothing new has been created. Rather, the existing regulatory pathway was made, uh, made non-operational. Figure 3.1 shows schematically how this approach destroys the regulation of biosynthesis. Increased penicillin production by penicillium chrysogenum is the first 
uh, pardon me, as a result of increased copy numbers of relative, relevant genes caused by classical strain improvement, mutation, and selection. And what happens is you have, a, and normally you have a feedback that shuts off the production of C when you've got enough of it by stopping the enzyme that travels, uh, that converts from A to B. But if you destroy that feedback loop, then A will overproduce B, B will overproduce C, and uh, that's bad for the organism, but it's nice for the person who's collecting the result. I take another example from my own experience. Xylitol is a five carbon sugar alcohol and a non-carrogenic tooth friendly sweetener. It is produced by chemical methods from hardwood species like birch. These trees have a fiber polymer called xylan, which is formed mainly of a long chain of xylose sugar molecules. Xylose can be converted to xylitol by reduction using candida yeasts. We wanted to improve the xylitol production process by inducing random mutations by toxic chemicals or ultraviolet light. Out of the thousands of mutants so created, we isolated a xylitol overproducing strain where the natural xylitol mechanism was retarded, illustrated in figure 3.2. In nature, such organisms are not viable, but they are useful as production organisms. In order to not lose such mutant organisms, they must be carefully kept isolated in aseptic conditions, because the natural strain will outcompete them. So what, what normally happens is that xylose is metabolized to xylitol, which is metabolized to xylulose, but this particular strain can't make it, and so it does other things with it. Um, designed by genetic engineering. Strains that overproduce a desired component can also be designed by modern genetic engineering tools. In enzyme production, several copies of a specific gene can be added to the production strain. In the 1980s and 90s, the enzyme industry constructed new protein stra production strains using this method. Certain fungi like uh, Aspergillus and Trichoderma and bacteria like Bacti Bacillus subtilis can secrete tens of grams of enzymes per liter of culture. Again, we're looking at uh, in the neighborhood of uh, one to 10 percent. Intracellular enzymes can also be overproduced. For example, more than 100 copies of xylose isomerase genes were introduced into Streptomyces rubiginosus in plasmids that is, extra chromosomal DNA, such strains carry a large load of genes which the organism does not need. Such an organism survives only as a pure culture in isolated reactors. In nature, it would rapidly lose the extra genes. Genetic engineering tools have also been extensively used to bring new genes or even complete metabolic pathways into existing organisms. This is a difficult task. It takes a long time and has its limits. A real workhorse of biotechnology has been the bacterium E. coli. It has been converted to produce such compounds as indigo blue, uh, four, one, oh, pardon me, indigo blue, that should be uh, uh, reference four. One, three, propane diol for the chemical industry, isoprene as a starting material for synthetic rubber, human insulin, erythropoietin, and even fatty acids for biodiesel. These are examples of systematic design of re reaction pathways. However, this is possible only when the basic metabolism of E. coli is not disturbed and the products are not toxic. Again, such organisms are not viable in nature and quickly either die or lose the extra foreign genetic material. To demonstrate the limits of such processes, I again use xylitol as an example. We wanted to produce xylitol from glucose, which is both cheap and easily available. Baker's yeast is an efficient metabolizer of glucose and has a pathway to produce xylitol intermediates. Addition of two genes, um, we'll show figure 3.2 in a little bit, show uh, uh, xylose reductase and xylitol dehydrogenase into this organism should at least theoretically result in xylitol production. The idea worked, but the yield of xylitol was very low, only 2.5%. A similar approach with bacteria reached conversion yields of 
That is to say, w a little under one quarter of the glucose they fed the organisms turned into xylitol, which is the highest reported for xylitol production f from glucose with a bacterial strain. Now you know how this guy gets his money. And what happens is, again, uh, what we showed before. Um, evolution experiments with <coughs> microorganisms. All such experiments are examples of design, not processes that happen in nature. Once an organism is isolated and cultivated in a flask, its environment is no longer natural for the organism. Such experiments, however, demonstrate what the limits of natural changes are and equally important, their direction. In 1968, Wu et al. published results that showed that Aerobacter aerogenes bacterium had learned to grow on xylitol. This was used as an example of evolution. What had actually happened? One mutation had destroyed the normal regulatory system in the bacteria. This resulted in a continuous production of one of its enzymes capable of reducing xylitol. Nothing new was created. Experiments carried out by Barry Hall shed more light on this. He studied E. coli and its ability to evolve. The bacterium can use the milk sugar lactose as its energy source. For this purpose, it has a permease on its cell membrane to transport lactose into the cell and an enzyme called lactase, or beta-galactosidase, to split lactose into two simple sugar, uh, glucose and galactose, figure 3.3, which we'll look at shortly. Hall destroyed the lactose, lactase encoding uh, gene, which resulted in mutants that could no longer use lactose as the energy source. And there's the, uh, there's the drawing. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to tell you there's a mistake on this. That is, if you look at that um, oxygen, it's going straight up. This oxygen is what they call equatorial. And that means that really, that one is galactose instead of glucose, so they need to be switched. But whatever. Um, when Hall cult cultivated these mutated cells in lactose-containing nutrient solutions, uh, mutants regularly appeared that could grow on lactose. What had happened? E. coli has an enzyme, EBG, that closely resembles the lactase enzyme though it is not able to degrade lactose. A single mutation in EBGA, the gene that codes for EBG, is sufficient to allow slow growth on lactose. Only EBG, the, res the role of which is unclear, could be mutated to use lactose, although according to Hall, the best EBG enzyme does not even approach the catalytic efficiency of the LAC-Z enzyme. A single mutation in a large bacterial population with billions of cells is well within the reach of random evolution. By the way, you take that one other gene out and the bacteria do not produce lactase at all. Richard Lenski's experiments with E. coli are probably the best known long-term evolution simulating experiments. The meaning of these experiments has been thoroughly discussed by B Michael Behe. The organism lost many of its capabilities, such as making flagella, and required nothing that it did not already have, such as citrate intake and utilization. In bacteria, evolution means losing genes. The species compete to grow and reproduce the fastest, and therefore get rid of all unnecessary functions. It's sort of like um, having race cars that ditch their spare tires, because it's better not to have them. Uh, the most impressive evolutionary experiment so far reported was carried out by an international team using Salmonella enterica. In October 22, 2012, a, a report claimed that this was the first time anyone had demonstrated the origin of a new gene. In reality, a gene with weak site activity was duplicated and the site activity was strengthened. Nothing more, nothing new. Yet this is how the work was described in the scientific literature. The emphasis is mine to show at what points intelligence was introduced in the experiment. Researchers engineered a gene that governs the synthesis of the amino acid histidine and also made some minor contributions to synthesizing another amino acid, tryptophan. They then placed multiple copies of the gene in salmonella bacteria that did not have the normal gene for creating tryptophan. The salmonella kept copying the beneficial effects of the gene, making tryptophan, 
And over the course of 3,000 generations, the two functions diverged into two entirely different genes, marking the first time that researchers had directly observed the creation of an entirely new gene in a controlled laboratory setting. There's one more interesting evolution experiment carried out using E. coli. It is generally assumed that a multi-step mutational evolutionary path is possible if all the intermediate steps are functional and can be reached with a single mutation. The activity produced in this way may, however, be so weak that the cell must overexpress the hypothetical newly formed enzyme. In other words, produce large quantities of this enzyme. This is a huge strain to the cell because it has to use extra synthetic cap capacity for this. Therefore, it is very well possible that the cell gets rid of such a weak activity, even if it could be beneficial. Gager et al. studied what happened in such a case under laboratory conditions. They introduced two mutations into a trip A gene that interfered with the tryptophan amino acid synthesis, which of course cell needs. One mutation destroyed the activity completely and the other one only partially. The cell could have regained the tryptophan synthesis pathway by two consecutive mutations. In other words, this is a perfect setup for evolution. However, this did not happen. The experiment showed that even if the cell could acquire a new activity by gene duplication and mutations, it would get rid of it because the new activity is too large a burden. Although the described experiments are often promoted as evidence for evolution, they are actually all designed and in fact they probe the limits of natural phenomena. They do not reflect what actually happens in nature. Recently Chatterjee et al. published an important paper. The authors evaluate the time scale that is needed for evolutionary in, uh, innovations and the money quote is, the estimated number of bacterial cells on earth is about 10 to the 30. To give a specific example, let us assume that there are 10 to the 24 independent searches, each with a population size of 1 million. The probability that at least one of these independent searches succeeds within the 10 to the 14th generations for sequence length L equals 1000 and broad peak C equals 1 half is less than 10 to the minus 26. Those are not exactly good odds. Tens of years of experimental evidence with microorganisms can be summarized as follows, and there's several points that are made, but the last one is probably the most important one. Isolated microbial populations in laboratory experiments vary within narrow limits and lose information over time. Again, genetic entropy. Proteins. There's general agreement among scientists that the sequence bu of building blocks of a biopolymer represents a type of molecularly coded information. It is the specific ordering of nucleotides or amino acids building up DNA, RNA, or protein molecules that determine their structure and function. Proteins are the most versatile and efficient in terms of function. To be convinced of this, it is sufficient to take just a glance at a poster with metabolic pathways showing the plethora of reactions catalyzed by enzymes and there's an enzyme for every pathway. There's even an enzyme that catalyzes the, the splitting apart of carbon dioxide, carbonic acid into carbon dioxide and water, which happens naturally, but just not fast enough for the body. Uh, 20 amino acids are the building blocks of the proteins present in all living organisms from bacteria to humans. The average protein is about 300 amino acids in length, more precisely, 267 for bacterial and 361 for eukaryotic proteins. Our cells take more amino acids than the bacteria do. These 300 amino acids can be ordered in 20 to the 300 or 10 to the 390 different ways. Scientists generally agree, based on several lines of experimental evidence uh, data, that more than one specific protein sequence is capable of performing a particular function. But scientists still debate the size of the fraction of functional protein molecules among non-functional ones, as well as how best to describe the functional information residing in proteins. A rarity of functional proteins in protein space. Jack Sostak, Nobel laureate in 2009, and his co-workers have, over the last 20 years, made extensive studies related to evolution of proteins with new functions. Their work is of exceptional importance because of 
not only its methodological novelty, but also its conceptual originality, depth, and breadth. Skipping over a little bit, conclusion, this is Sostak and company. We suggest that functional proteins are sufficiently common in protein sequence, roughly ten, 1 in 10 to the 11th, that they may be discovered by entirely stochastic means, such as presumably operated uh, when proteins were first used by living organisms. Wait a minute. 10 to the 11th does not sound like the, let's say, 10 to the uh, 53rd to, 60, uh, to 77th that uh, Doug Axe came up with. Um, so then he critiques it, Kozlilik and Lysola, in case you're wondering, that is Maddie Lysola, the, the author of this. Uh, and this paper is available on the internet, it's a fascinating paper. Have recently made a careful analysis of these results and have concluded that, even with extremely conservative assumptions, the probability of finding ATP binding activity which would function in a cell. And that's what they were measuring in that 10 to the 11th. It was ATP binding activity, that was it. Um, would be less than 1 in 10 to the 32, which makes the formation of functional activity by random selection a practical impossibility. ATP binding in general turns out to be a very easy, uh, well, not very easy, but easier than some uh, function for proteins to do. The 10 to the minus 32 fraction conservatively derived is significantly higher than some earlier estimates. Thus, Yaki, based on reported cytochrome C sequences, estimated that this fraction is 10 to the minus 65. Reidhar, Olson, and Sauer estimated that the function is 10 to the minus 63. Later, Axe concluded from his studies with penicillin degrading beta-lactamases that the probability of finding a functional enzyme among random sequences is about 10 to the minus 77 to 10 to the minus 53. And you can see that his is about the same as those other people, um, but the 10 to the uh, uh, 11th just sounds wild. In a study of four large protein families, Durston and Chu estimated that the functional sequence sequences occupy an extremely small fraction of sequence space in all cases lower than 10 to the minus 100. On the other hand, the estimate of Taylor et al. is that a library of 10 to the 24th members should contain an arrow Q mutase. In view of these different figures, and given the paucity of experimental data at present, one can be sure that the fraction of functional proteins among random sequences is lower than 10, 1 in 10 to the 20th. Behe and the Edge of Evolution and in subsequent work has provided strong evidence that such an edge exists. And if you think about it, there has to be such an edge because if you walk into a petri dish that was growing some kind of organism overnight and you find a cockroach in it, you do not originally assume that the cockroach evolved from the, uh, from the bacteria. There has to be an edge. Um, Sanford in the genetic entropy has explained, and I don't know why he says the genetic entropy, because as I recall, it was just genetic entropy. But anyway, has explained not only why natural selection is poor at creating novelty in genomes, but also why it is incapable of present, preventing genome deterioration. Axe has given strong evidence as to why just a single new protein fold remains beyond the reach of evolutionary processes. A random modification of existing protein structures. Enzymes are widely used for many different applications in washing powders, food manufacturing, the textile injury, animal in, in industry, excuse me, animal feed, and chemical production, etc. And I might add in medicine. Unfortunately, natural enzymes are not always suitable for industrial conditions where High temperatures, extremes of pH, and a variety of other chemicals interfere with enzymatic reactions. Using the tools of genetic engineering, it is possible to modify existing enzymes with various methods. One approach is to randomly mutate the gene coding for a given enzyme. The process is called directed evolution, which is an oxymoron connecting two opposing terms. One then seeks to find better functioning mutants among the variants so created. Some amazing results have been achieved with this technique. Lysola and Trunin. Trunin is the 
gentleman I met um, in Finland. Uh, Lysola, of course, is the author of this article. Um, enzyme activity has been improved. Thermal and pH stability has increased. Specificity has changed to things we want it to change to more. Side activities have improved. Stability against solvents and oxidants has been has improved. Uh, in spite of these achievements, the technique has its limitations. There must be a mutational pathway to the new structure. One must be able to create a large enough mutant library in order to find the rare positive mutants. And finally, one must have a rapid screening method to detect the rare positive mutants. So once they're created, you've got to find them and then you've got to multiply those specific bacteria. Behe has estimated that the upper limit for a random mutational process is two to three simultaneous mutations in one protein. This is in harmony with Hall's results with lactose mutants. It also must be pointed out that directed evolution has nothing to do with what happens in nature. It is a name coined for a specific high type of design experiments. Extremely high mutation rates, carefully chosen reaction conditions, use of tools of genetic engineering, selection of variants towards a desired goal, etc., are all hallmarks of design. Design changes. I started to work with the xylanase enzyme in 1974 and since 1997, the aim of my research team was to modify its structure to improve its stability. We have designed a so-called disulfide bridge, uh, so-called disulfide bridges into the molecular or molecule in order to stabilize it against extreme temperatures and influence its pH stability and profile. They wanted to make the enzyme better and so they wanted to link it to where it couldn't untwist if it got hot. The, the probability of forming one bridge randomly is very low, only one in 20 million. The probability of forming two bridges is as low as one in four times 10 to the 14th. Alternatives. In practice, this is completely out of reach for random methods. Even further from what can actually happen in nature, which does not have the kind of artificial selection which can be 100%. Many research groups have tried to improve xylanase stability by random methods and in some cases with good results but have never created disulfide bridges. They've been trying to do this randomly. It has been suggested that new proteins are formed by duplication of genes. In such a case the gene keeps its original function while the new copy is free to mutate to new functions. The starting point would be a functional protein and it would not need to be built from scratch. This, however, has many problems. Where did the original gene come from? In other words, you've an you can answer how, how it diverged, but you can't answer where it started from. Um, the duplicated gene can change only within narrow limits. And three, over time, all genes degenerate. And ones that aren't doing something useful degenerate faster skipping over a bunch of stuff that's all good. I, I recommend that you read the entire article. Um, thus, it is much easier to build a new protein from scratch than to change a basic structure to a different one. I've now briefly reviewed the key results obtained during the last three decades of protein, and I've read even more briefly, uh, and especially enzyme engineering. The results can be uh, summarized as follows. Proteins can be modified with random and specifically designed methods, but only within narrow limits. The changes are not fundamental. Basic structures cannot be changed. All the experiments done are designed and have searched much larger space than the natural, proce than, than the natural processes could have searched. Even with huge amounts of intellectual input, nothing basically novel has been created. Knowledgeable intelligent agents would not try to change one protein structure to another by random experimentation, but would rather make a new one from the beginning. Why then does evolution continue to be believed? In 1972, I was sitting in the major lecture hall of the University of Helsinki as a young student of biochemistry. Francis Schaefer had come to Helsinki to give lectures during those lectures, I realized how naive was my concept of truth. I bought all his books and started my reading in philosophy, which I previously thought to be of little or no value. 
Some years later, I was reading as part of my biochemistry studies, Albert Leninger's Biochemistry. I remember that book too. The last chapter was about the origin of life, and I was surprised that instead of solid science, it contained basically philosophical speculations. The random proteinoids were synthesized by Sidney Fox were considered important in solving the problem of life's origin, and there was no discussion of the information problem. I also studied enzymes by Dixon and Webb. They openly and honestly discussed the real problem in the origin of life speculations. While Smith's the creation of life was an eye-opener. We have no idea where life and its huge information content came from. At that point, I invited three of my professors to discuss these important issues with me. After two sessions, I realized that they had no real answers, but had swallowed what I will call the modern concept of truth. See the discussion that follows without any further con uh, consideration. When asked to ask, why don't clear results and straightforward theoretical calculations convince scientists that evolution is only a story without a mechanism? The reason must be with outside of science. It is in philosophy. In Philebus of Plato, Socrates asked the, a key philosophical question. Whether all of this which they call the universe is left to the guidance of unreason and chance medley, or on the contrary, as our fathers have declared, ordered and governed by a marvelous intelligence and wisdom. Only a few scientists openly expressed their philosophical po starting point. The Nobel laureate Jack Sostak and his co co-workers uh, give an example and we'll skip over what they had to say. You can, if you're curious, read the book. Um, but it's pretty much what most people say who are in that camp. What then is the modern concept of truth? After hundreds of discussions over the years, it is quite clear to me that very few natural scientists are aware of their philosophical commitments. Even few, fewer know about Friedrich Hegel and his influence on the concept of truth. This is how Schaefer summarized Hegel's influence. All things are relativized. In so doing, Hegel changed the world. Kozilik and Lysola discussed to some extent, and that's the one that's on the internet and I recommend it, um, the effect of Hegelian thinking on the acceptance of evolution. I've talked with hundreds of students and professors around the world for the past 45 years. The influence of Hegelian thinking in association with naturalistic philosophy is overwhelming. Clear contradictions are tolerated. Trivial experimental results are interpreted to prove major philosophical concepts. And even when the experiments point in a different direction, they are interpreted as proving a presupposed point. Few scientists seem to be able to see the contradictions in the following statements. The formation of building blocks explains the origin of buildings. Of course not. All biological change is evolution. Well, yes, but then you can't use evolution in some other senses without pointing out the difference in meaning. Information loss is, uh, loss is information increase. Are polar bears a, a, a real advance on other bears? Especially their, hair, their coloring. Similarity proves common ancestry. Maybe common design. Intelligently designed experiments are proofs of natural phenomena. The modern concept of truth means that even clear experimental results are either relativized or interpreted to mean just the opposite of what they actually show. Let us give these statements a closer look. One in five, and um, that's the ones we just read. The origin of life experiments are an intelligently designed laboratory experiments and at best produce among large numbers of toxic chemicals some of the many building blocks of life. This is extremely far from producing even the simplest or living organism with its huge information content. Sometimes even the presence of water on the surface of planets is interpreted to be enough for life's origin. The same is true of the so-called directed evolution experiments of enzymes. And there's some other things that uh, they give examples of two through four. Uh, historical background. The, the dis this distinction between design and evolution was clear in 1859 when Charles Darwin published his Origin of Species. In 1844, 15 years before Darwin, Robert Chambers published Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, 
suggesting that species transmute, uh, transmutate under the guidance of a creative power, that is, by design. Chambers' idea was attacked strongly by the leading scientists of the time, including H Thomas Huxley, as well as by the theologians of the day. Darwin explicitly excluded the possibility that natural selection operates under any direction or guidance. Skipping over a lot of stuff there, in Darwin in his correspondence with Asa Gray said, your question of what would convince me of design is a poser. If I saw an angel coming down to teach us good and I was convinced from others seeing him that I was not mad, I should believe in design. If I could be convinced thoroughly that life and mind was, in, in an unknown way, a function of other imponderable force, I should be convinced. If man was made of brass or iron in no way connected with any other organism which had ever lived, I should perhaps be convinced. But this is childish writing. That's a pretty high bar. Skipping on a lot. For theistic evolutionists, terms like directed evolution, evolutionary strategy, evolutionary design, coordinated evolution, those are all oxymorons. Evolutionary creationism, theistic evolution, etc., makes sense. Darwinists today tolerate these terms because that is the price they are willing to pay for maintaining the appearance of validity of the whole Darwinian dogma. When pressed about their true meaning, Darwinists usually say that such terms are mere metaphors. Uh, then he takes David Snoke and quotes him, many have demanded that the intelligent design paradigm must come up with a successful, predictive, quantitative program for biology. But it seems that such a program already exists right under our noses. Every time you say, what is this protein doing instead of is it doing anything you're doing a design uh, uh, protocol I agree with Snoke I have discussed with Kozilik at length how in biochemistry and molecular biology an illusion of the continuation of the evolutionary research program is maintained in significant measure by using and accepting contradictions contradictor contradictio in ejecto, evolutionary creationism. If design is equated with evolution, there is no possibility for overthrowing evolution without also overthrowing design. My view is that nothing can lo be logically proven to people who, like Kenneth Miller, equate things that are contradictory. There's a quote earlier on Kenneth Miller that we skipped over. That two things cannot be true and not true at the same time is a law, the principle of non-contradiction, well known to Plato, by Plato and Aristotle. Now one may try to argue that evolution and design are not contradictory. However, the writings of Charles Darwin and his contemporaries and of many others since that, then prove that they are. Darwin and his followers explicitly claim that chance variation and the law of natural selection have created all species of living organisms. If so, design is ruled out. In contrast, if design is the cause of the creation of species, then chance and law are ruled out as the creators of species. Now, that's the end of the chapter. My take is Matty, and I misspelled it there, it's M-A-T-T-I, Lysola, brings a unique perspective to the design evolution controversy, his day job is creating bacteria and fungi, etc., that will create metabolic products that can be commercially exploited. If he could actually use evolution to find new enzymes, it would be financially rewarding for him. But it turns out all he can do is improve the ones, and of course it's not improvement for the, for the organism itself. It's improvement for us. For his own pocketbook, it would be nice if evolution worked as advertised but it doesn't. Design works much better. If you're going to get those uh, uh, disulfide bridges, you're much better off trying to actually recreate or, or edit the uh, DNA. He's also much more aware of the importance of philosophy in this discussion, a point that Americans in particular often miss. And of course, these uh, it's true that uh, Richard Dawkins said that philosophy is dead, I think. 
or maybe it was Stephen Hawking, it, would, um, it actually isn't dead. His take is an interesting one. My only partial quibble is that I don't think that Hegel actually invented all this stuff. I think that Hegel allowed people to do what they always wanted to do anyway, and that's what made him popular. But then that was true for Darwin and for Lyell before him. Uh, they just gave b disbelief in the biblical account scientific respectability. If one is being fair to the scientific evidence, I think one is forced into a design perspective. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, uh, we have a question. Jack. <coughs> While I <coughs> agree with what was said, I've been sitting here thinking, well, <coughs> then the Creator really didn't like people who live in the third world because they are destroyed by organisms of his own design. Th uh, to me, that's how far this author has pushed the argument. It, it strikes me as being on the right track, but substantially an overkill. Otherwise, you can't get, get away from uh, all the negative things that are out there that couldn't have happened as a result of evolution. They must happen as a result of a designer. Um, I would agree with you to um, a certain extent. And in fact, I think that this is one of the things that fuels the, uh, I don't want to say plausibility, but the willingness to accept a non-design argument. See, if God designed other things, then he designed cancer, and he designed, probably more importantly, malaria parasites. Precisely. Um, and, uh, and so there's a, certain, there's a certain attempt to distance God from creation, or maybe even to deny that there is a God so that you don't blame this on what's supposed to be a loving God. That a, a universe with no God is preferable to a universe with Cthulhu. Um, however, I, I'm going to say two things. One of them is, from a full-blown creationist, by that I mean short life, it's a lot easier to understand because you can simply say these things were not part of the original creation. Um, and so creationism does, uh, proper short age creationism, does not suffer from the, uh, from the problems to near the extent that either old age creationism or uh, theistic evolution with an ID uh, bent suffers from. And by the way, we'll run back into that question later on uh, when we discuss the theological problems. Because it turns out that some of those theological problems are also suffered by uh, old earth creationism and by, uh, and by uh, the ID-friendly theistic evolution. Now, uh, there's, there's one other point that I think that is critically important, and that is that uh, design detection does not depend upon the um, niceness of the design. And that is to say, that AK-47s and hydrogen bombs are unquestionably designed. As a matter of fact, there are some organisms that have been designed for biological warfare with added features that, uh, uh, that make them killers. That does not mean that they evolved. 
uh, I think that it is very important for us to understand that design in snake venom, for example, is not the destroyer of the design hypothesis. What it is, is a destroyer of the hypothesis that God's in his heaven and all's right with the world. <clears throat> we very quickly get back to the philosophical underpinnings. Yes. Since we really have no place to go, but that's too strong. We can't get to all the places we would like to as creationists with some simple assumptions. Yes. And that we err as much as those who will only uh, ascribe anything as here due to philosophical naturalism. We go just to, often to the same extreme, which I feel this author has done. If he'd stopped short and looked at some of these questions, maybe yeah. he does, I would see it as more of a po positive contribution, even though I agree with almost everything he says in detail. Yeah. But I don't know how you get away from ascribing to a loving creator all of the nasty things that are out there, if he's totally right. Yeah, well, I would agree with that. The only thing of it is that, um, you know, Jesus in the parable of the tares says, he doesn't say it's time and chance that caused the tears. He says an enemy has done this. So then we put into the hands of the enemy the ability to create at this level. Yeah, not well, at least to modify. Yeah. I'm sorry, well, I'm using old arguments. I don't no, no, I understand, I understand that. I understand, yeah, but and the it, they're important the arguments, but they we but have it, to understand what the implications are right. when we go too far. They are important arguments, but it is also important to realize what they prove and what they do not prove. Exactly. What they do not prove is there is no design. Any more than if you happen to be in an island paradise um, somewhere and you walk across and you suddenly you see a rope tied to a sapling that's been bent uh, over a uh, uh, and and hooked onto a, a lasso that you can say that wasn't designed because the alternative is that there's somebody wicked that that wants to kill you or wanted to kill somebody else at least and uh, by uh, you know stringing you up tough you, you're going to have to accept that there is malevolent design. And you're going to have to explain it. Okay. And, and we need to, we, you know, we sometimes try to ignore the fact that there is malevolent design. But there is. And the quicker we get over our prejudices and, and accept what the evidence is telling us, the better off we are. If you find out that somebody has been trying to get into your bank account and drain your account dry, the smart thing to do is to figure out uh, some way to try to prevent that from happening again or, or from them to being able to complete it. Because ignoring it is asking for trouble. The, you know, this this life is not. Uh, it. I mean, like I say, the theology that God's in His heaven and all's right with the world, which is Paley's theology, by the way, uh, is just inadequate to handle the problems. Of course. And we need to just say that right up front. But the, the, again, I come back to the point. If there is design, there is at least one designer. And that means that if there's malevolent design, there's at least one malevolent designer. Now, is the designer of the good and the designer of the evil the same person? Uh, that's an interesting philosophical question. 
Well, some we, some might the, say they he was lear, he was learning as he was going along. So that's one way to. Yeah, you could say he was incompetent say, designer, I suppose. And he's learning. He's you know, his, so forth. That I mean, there, there's a number of different ways of dealing with that. But like I say, the one way you can't deal with it is God's got this under control and He's doing everything. Just you know, you, there's no problems. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I had another thought on this uh, part of the confusion. I think might be the fact is we do observe microevolution. I guess maybe that even that's a discussion of whether that's the proper term even to use evolution for that. But there's variations that we see that are adaptive. And I think the problem is then that's, and then now it gets to the, your philosophical starting point of, uh, so you over extrapolate. The problem is that the microevolution is over extrapolated then to to include everything and so I think that's right. where part of the problem is and I don't, and I don't know is it looks like they're making some progress on what are the limits of adaptation so I don't know that we can be definitive about that how how much that extends out yeah. so that's maybe where some of the willingness to accept contradiction comes in because we see it operating there's even there it's there's something driving that adaptation so it's not coming randomly you'd have a hard time arguing randomness for that so but anyway that to me is is part of the problem of over extrapolating what we do observe yeah it is a it is a problem uh, but I encourage people not to try to try to uh, fix the problem by simply saying there is no design. Right. Um, well, then that's a philosophic yeah. presupposition yeah. if you're not going to close yourself off to that idea. Yeah. In, in fact, um, I was just reading through uh, because it was uh, of, of interest the blind watchmaker. And you, you know, biology is the study of uh, complex objects that give the appearance of being designed for a purpose. Well, you keep reading that paragraph, and then you read the next paragraph, and you find out that Richard Dawkins considers um, uh, computers and cars, automobiles, uh, to be uh, living. And you're going, but wait a minute, they don't live, they don't metabolize, and, and, and there's a good argument that they're not living, of course, but he says, that, he says but, if you were to find a computer or an automobile on a planet, it would be proof that there had been living organisms on that planet at one time. That there either were or had been. And, that the, and, and you know, that's the interesting point is that he didn't fill out the rest of it. It's not proof of living organisms, it's proof of intelligent living organisms. And I think that that, but of course, if he goes there, he's basically given away the store. Yes. It seemed to me as I read this article that he was saying, we, we tinker around with all this stuff, but we don't ever come up with anything brand new. So, so you have a bacteria or whatever you're working with and you tinker with it you haven't created it, you've tinkered with it. If that's the case, then don't we have a malevolent tinkerer and a tinkerer that is positive? And so you have the same little cell that was created by God. Evil can tinker with it, but that doesn't make God responsible for the evil tinkering. Yes, and that, that is the advantage of having a short age creation where God creates a perfect world and then does God do the tinkering? Does the devil do the tinkering? Do, do people back then who understood a little bit about genetic engineering maybe do the tinkering? I don't know. Somebody did the tinkering though. And I agree with that, but, but to blame everything that has happened on a good creator and say, well, it's all his fault that cancer is here. Maybe looking at it wrong. Maybe it's the evil tinkerer who took what God created and made cancer. 
Yeah, I'm reminded of the uh, comic Flip Wilson, who uh, the devil made me do it. Um, yeah, well, let's let's just put it this: the the devil had some cooperation. Oh yeah, for for him. <laughs> but I I think it's uh, you know again it's important for us to realize that. The objection to design is really an objection to I don't like where we're going rather than an objection to uh, the evidence doesn't really support this. And I think that's an important, really important point. It's more of a, it's more of a problem uh, with, with, uh, with what is this going to leave us with philosophically and I don't like where this is looks like it's going. Um, the fact of the matter is the evidence is pretty much overwhelming. As opposed to the people who say the evidence is overwhelming on the other side. It really isn't overwhelming on the other side. And if you don't believe me, start reading about the origin of life research that we have which we'll cover next week. It is just amazing. Uh, and I mean, once God has got a foothold in there, then how he does it is up to him. And I think you can argue that, uh, that at that point, origins is far more influenced by theology, that is what God would do, than it is by what nature can do on its own. And I think that's a discussion that many people don't want to have. Uh, yes, comment back. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah go um, ahead and then we'll give it oh, to you. When the Lord said, Adam, Eve, listen, I'm cursing the ground. How far did that go? You see, Look at that cactus. This the thorn of the cactus is really modified skin. Yeah. Okay. Look at the Anopheles uh, mosquito. It's the only one. The male does not. It drinks the sap of the tree. Perhaps. And the female could have drunk sap of trees too. It, that, it, that, that, originally. That gives us malaria. Yeah. So, I mean, in that curse, I curse the ground because of you. you look at the. Um, parrots in uh, New Zealand. They were very happy until the New Zealand government says, okay, this area, we're going to build all these apartments. These parrots had nothing else to eat. Uh, and so they were going and hitting the sheep and getting this uh, fat from the back. They were killing all these sheep there. Yeah. I yeah. think you know about that. Oh, yeah. Because we are messing with... <laughs> we, we make... 19,000 tons of antibiotics in this country. 70% of goes of that goes to the pigs and the cattle and 80%. the chicken. Yeah, 70, 80%. We are paying the price for it, human beings. Someone gets a little viral infection. Well, here is the Zitromax. We are destroying the normal flora of the gut. There, there's nine times more bacteria in our large intestine than. And so we are really truly paying the price for uh, being so smart. Yeah. Well, and we, we try and, to and being short-sighted, and in some cases selfishly short-sighted. Yeah, very much so. This doctor is no good. He didn't give me the antibiotic, or he didn't yeah. give me the dialogic. Yeah, yeah. And then we wind up with systems. Uh, 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 we wind up with addictions and we wonder where they came from. Well, it came from, it came uh, partly from doctors who are making patients happy and partly from governments who are saying, you yes. must treat pain. Okay, there you are. You must treat pain. I, I'm sorry. I tell the CEO, you can fire me now. If I'm not convinced that this person needs dialogue, I don't, I'm not going to give. Very simple. You can fire me whenever you want. But, you're right. I mean, we are really, truly getting these things. Oh, yeah. One out of every th three child in this country is by C-section. So, okay, um, Eve was, that's what I'm saying. Eve was, uh, you're going to have a hard time during your birth. But the 
the newborn going through the mother's birth canal gets all the all the bacteria that it needs to build up its immune system. Yes. Today, these ones who are born out of C-section, the, the, they are getting the bad bacteria in the OR. It's so wrong, yeah. it's so sad. What would be interesting is to do a study of the relative health of C-section versus... Yeah, uh, they're uh, not going to do it, but it's yeah. a mess in Mishnikov, right? He drank uh, the cholera, uh, yeah. you know that name of the gentleman, and he, he didn't die. I mean, the father yeah. of immunology, so... Anyway, go ahead. We, we want you to have two mics so that we can be One sure to catch you now. I speak with fork and tongue. <laughs> um, just a statement. Put everything, in my opinion, in the great controversy. Um, it's, there's two forces out there. And if scientists today can tinker with uh, things and produce mass uh, weapons of destruction and chemicals. And God doesn't strike them dead before they he, do it. He doesn't. And if God curses the ground, uh, it's the same as God using his wrath and bad people come on Israel. So I mm -hmm. think when he cursed the ground, he knew what Satan was going to start. I mean, it's just God created some really neat things, and everything God created, Satan began to uh, turn bad. And all you have to do is mutate the uh, leaf stem of a plant, and all of a sudden you've got a thorn. Yeah. And so I have no problem at all with uh, mentioning Satan as a tinkerer, either him personally or through his uh, agents. You know, people on earth who come up with bad things, which they did from the beginning anyway. So I really like this whole idea. We're in a, we're in a war, and there's Satan, and there's God. And, uh, What's not the, is invoking things on them, is giving them up to follow their own course. There's an interesting comment uh, that Sister White made in regard to the flood that uh, part of the reason for the flood was that before the flood, a number of individuals were manipulating things in such a way that the sanctity of the human was being interfered with. Do you remember where that was? Which uh, suggests that maybe some of these... I think that's an amalgamation of man and beast uh, quotation. And that, right. uh, that uh, some of these uh, yeah. Greek uh, things that you know, were... Uh, where there was eagle head combined with some other type of body and that type of thing, that some of those may have been actually things that were uh, manipulated and created before the flood and then were then brought back to, to the remembrance after the flood, but maybe not created after the flood, but may have been created before the flood, dishonoring the the beauty of the uh, human. Well, certainly uh, serpents changed and uh, uh, became uh, I think rightly re re revived. There's a, there was a uh, interesting tweezer that was found in a lump of coal and it was on display. You know, it was an interesting tweezer and there was a researcher who was doing genetic research saw that tweezer and he looked at it and he said, that tweezer is identical with the tweezers that I'm using now to do genetic manipulation on cells. And here was a tweezer that was found in a lump of coal. Um, yeah, it does raise some very interesting questions. I, I, I think it's, again, design is not destroyed if we find malevolent design. All it means is there is a malevolent designer. That's all it means. Um, and I think that Lysola, frankly, has it pretty well nailed, and he points out that the one study that seems to imply that it's easy to produce proteins 
uses, um, if I can put it that way, twisted statistics, and it's using only one function, and it's probably one of the easiest functions for a protein to do, and that is to stick to DNA. Um, and that actually may be an advantage because if you think about it, protein that is able to stick to DNA perhaps could be uh, then used to, uh, the DNA sticking could be used to modify the production rate of that particular protein if it's an enzyme, which means it's convenient to have an extra side. Uh, that if you think about it, ATP, which shuts off a lot of things and turns on a lot of other enzymes, um, is in fact um, uh, extremely useful in influencing the body's uh, metabolism. Uh, so you could even think of that as a, a design feature itself, uh, although it has been exaggerated, I think. And uh, Lysola and uh, uh, whatever, um, Kozilic, I think it is, the, uh, are pointing out that, uh, that the estimate was, in fact, grossly exaggerated, and that 10 to the 20th is far more likely than 10 to the 11th. Uh, for that one function. Anyway, tomorrow we're going to go to the origin of life and James Tour, who designs nano cars. And if you, if you like cars, <laughs> you're going to see the smallest cars in the world. Where is this? What? Nano cars. These are like microscopic cars. They, in order to see them, you have to use a tunneling, uh, a quantum tunneling electron microscope. But they actually run. <laughs> <laughs>